on up to give us our message. Thanks, Brian. Well, good morning, everyone. It's really great to see uh, y'all here today. Thank you, worship team, for just a tremendous time of leading us into worship. Um, and I'm excited that we are going to continue um, this posture of worship because when we hear the word and the different things that we're going to do today, that's all part of our worship. Uh, so my name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm just really glad that you're here this morning. Today, we have a special worship gathering in that um, over the last uh, several weeks as part of our Advent series, as a church, we've committed to collecting welcome kits, which you see some of them uh, here and there. Um, and the idea of that is we've been uh, forming these welcome kits in as you know, small groups, in our life groups, as families, as individuals. And the hope is to give these to refugees who are resettling here in Houston. Um, and we're doing this with our partnership through Houston Welcomes Refugees. Um, and at the end of the message, what we're going to do is um, Cindy Wu, who works with HWR, is going to share uh, some words about the Welcome Kits and her organization. And then we're going we're to write notes and dedicate these kits. Um, so, uh, I, you know, when I think about the ways in which we worship, I can't think of a better way to worship, right, by loving uh, the people that God loves, right, loving our neighbors an extension of worship and an expression of worship. So, uh, but before we do all that, um, I'm going to give a short message, and uh, we are in a series called Waiting on God, and today's focus or topic is Waiting on God for Peace, for Peace. So let, let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, thank you so much for this gorgeous day. It's just one of many tangible expressions of your grace and peace to us. And we want to open ourselves up, Lord, this morning to what you have to say to us, how you want to move in us. And I pray that we would have ears to hear, hearts that are open, uh, and just a posture of receiving, Lord, from you, that we might then bless those around us and bless your name. So thank you so much for this time, and, and I commit it to you. God, would you be uh, pleased and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the New Testament, there's this common salutation that you'll often find in the epistles written by Paul. And it's the phrase, grace and peace to you. And so Paul would often write, you know, to the church at Ephesus, grace and peace to you. Uh, to the church at Thessalonica, grace and peace. And peace to you. And in a time when the church was facing very intense and rigorous persecution, these were the things that the church desperately needed. You know, so this wasn't just some generic greeting, you know, like, hey, what's up? It was, it was like they really needed a daily provision of God's grace and God's peace. And so when I think about our day today, fast forward all these years today, while our context and the situation and the time is very, very different, I still believe many of us need a daily provision of God's grace and peace. That many of us are looking for that. Uh, when I think and turn on the radio and I just listen to the political discourse these days, it just makes my blood boil. I feel frustrated, I feel my anxiety increasing, I feel infuriated. You know, all this attention given to impeachment, you know, you think about it, what it's done is really it's made both left and right side, you know, whatever camp you stand on, even further and further apart. I was talking to a friend just a, a week ago who is dreading uh, the Thanksgiving conversations because they were so afraid of what political conversations would come up. Um, I think about all the, the just the mass shootings or mass stabbings that are nonsensical and tragic and that which keep happening over and over again. Uh, Hong Kong has been engulfed in protests that have become increasingly violent that is threatening to bring the city to its knees. Grace and peace. We really need these at a national and a global level. Uh, just the other day, I was about to turn left at a light, and as soon as the light had turned green, like literally a split second later, the person behind me honked me really rudely and loudly. And my first thought was, what's your problem, man? 
just as I'm sure they were thinking the same thing about me. At home, my kids, they bicker about senseless things, like senseless, I don't understand kind of things, like, no, that's my cushion, like couch cushion. No, that's my cushion. No, it doesn't belong to any of yours, but they, they argue about it. No, it's my turn to sit on the left. Wah, 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 and it drives me crazy. Sometimes Grace and I get in arguments, and there are times while we're arguing that I will actually have like an out-of-body experience. Well, I'll watch myself and us having this back and forth, and I'm wondering, John, what are you even arguing about right now? But I can't stop. You know, that, that train has, that anger train has left the station and it's going full steam ahead. Grace and peace, we need these in our lives, in our families, and on our roads. And at night, uh, when I lay down on my pillow, um, and all these thoughts start to swirl around in my head that have been sort of like background noise during the day, thoughts about... Uh, a conversation that didn't go the way that I had hoped, about a relationship that feels strained, about the things that have been left undone, or even the broader questions of like, what am I doing? Who, who am I? Who am I becoming? And all those thoughts swirl there, and then finally I fall asleep. But then when I wake up, those thoughts just kick right back in. And then during the day, they become background noise for my day. What about you? Grace and peace, I think we need these at a heart and a mind at a soul level. And so it's my contention that we long for peace, don't we? We long for it, but it's so elusive. It like escapes our grasp. Um, and what God wants us to know this morning is that God created us to live in peace, to know peace with him, and to be at peace with our neighbor, and to be at peace with the world that he created, but that we are not very good at making peace, keeping it, or preserving it. The scriptures attest to this reality just right from the get-go. You know, right after the dawn of creation, the first husband and wife experienced a cataclysmic rift during their honeymoon. And y'all, and you ever been there? Like your biggest argument was during your honeymoon, all right? And then their children, their two sons. One son leers the other son into a field and kills him. And ever since then, siblings have been rivals. Israel, God's chosen people, they begin this history that alternates between conquered and conquer. And they find themselves always at war, at war with their neighbors, at war with foreign powers, and at war within themselves. And if you look at the Psalms, right, that, that great prayer book of the Bible, which contains one of, you know, some of the most peaceful and eloquent prayers ever prayed. You know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And yet right next to those prayers are prayers like Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so the Bible doesn't try to pretend that the world is all fine and good. In fact, quite the opposite. It confronts the ugly, uh, the ugly and the brutal realities of living in a fallen world where both good and evil coexist. But alongside these same scriptures, God gives us hope because the text also paints a picture of a future that is marked by peace. It contains promise after promise after promise of a coming day when peace will come to this earth and will come fullness and it imagines a peace that is as deep as it is wide it is a peace that wipes away every tear that heals every pain that brings wholeness where there is brokenness it touches every relationship even the animal kingdom itself is impacted predator and prey live in peace revelation 21 puts it this way then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So in this future day where there is strife, it will give way to peace. Where there is discord and pain, they will give way to peace. And the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah pictures this future like this. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. That's beautiful. That's hard for me to believe because my kids are like definitely afraid of like a little roach, right? So, uh, It's a picture where relationships are living in harmony. So this is the future that we look towards even as we look in our present and we see so much pain. It is a future that overflows with life, with peace, with justice, with God himself at the very center. That is our future, but what about now? What about in the present? What do we do? We wait. Um, This past summer, our family had the chance to go to Hawaii for the first time. And as I've shared about it uh, a couple times before, we loved it. It was like paradise. Uh, It was such an incredible experience. Um, But what I didn't share is that getting there was brutal. (laughs) It was brutal. It was like we descended to Hades and then back, right? So I knew that we were in trouble when on the first leg from Houston to LA, our twins started melting down and they were saying, it's too long, I can't wait anymore. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh. Because what they didn't realize is that Houston to LA is the shorter of the legs (laughs) from LA to Hawaii. So waiting was so, 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 so very painful. But was it worth it? Oh, you bet. And was it necessary? How else were we gonna get there? Because our waiting was not doing nothing. During our waiting, we were actually flying at 500 miles per hour towards our destination. Now, if we had been like sitting on a Metro bus, that would be a problem because sitting on a Metro bus isn't gonna get us to our destination. Our waiting wasn't in circles, it wasn't meandering, it had a purpose, an intention, and a direction. I wanna suggest that Advent is kinda like that. It is about a deliberate and intentional waiting. It's a season of being reminded that we are waiting but not waiting in vain. Our waiting isn't going in circles. We are actually moving towards God's gracious peace because of who we are waiting for, right? We are moving towards God's gracious peace because of who we are waiting for. Um, In the early 1960s, Don and Carol Richardson, um, if you follow mission history, you might know that name because they're kind of pretty legendary. They moved to Indonesia to work with the Sawi people. And so the Sawis were a tribal people. They were uh, cannibalistic. And um, one of the very remarkable features of this uh, tribal people was that uh, they valued and they exalted betrayal as a high virtue. And so eventually when uh, Don and Carol were able to translate the gospel narratives into the language, When they came to the story in the part where Judas betrays Jesus, they saw Judas as the hero. And Jesus was the loser who got duped and fooled. And so it was a very challenging context and assignment. 
and particularly because the three tribes were at war, just a bloody, violent war. But then a breakthrough happened when the tribes decided to offer peace to one another. And it was then that the Richardsons realized that there was a, a doorway and a pathway to explain the gospel. Because in the Sawi culture, the way you would make peace was that you would offer your very child to your enemy. You would just, you would give your child to your enemy and they would take that child in and that way you would make peace. That child would be called the peace child. And so I'm sure your minds are making the connections and they realize, oh my goodness, this is the way to help explain what God has done for the world that Jesus is the ultimate peace child. And so at Advent, we are waiting for the arrival of Christmas when the peace child was born. At Advent, God entered the strife. He entered the discord and the pain, and he gave his very own life. It is why at the birth of Jesus, there's an angelic chorus that announces glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The coming of Jesus was the announcement of peace. So by coming in human form through Jesus' life, through his sacrificial death and then his triumphant resurrection. What God has done through Jesus is to bridge the gap that separated us from our creator and made a way forward possible. He has made the way of peace possible. Jesus has broken the curse of sin and death and all which alienates us from God, all which Uh, contributes to our strife and our lack of peace and he has made a new way possible that is why Ephesians 6 talks about this as the announcement of the gospel of peace Jesus is the prince of peace as we sang Jesus is the peace child who literally in his life began a revolution of peace. But that revolution is not finished yet. It has not been fulfilled. There's a day when it will come in fullness, but until then, we wait. And what does that mean? What does it mean to wait for God's peace? I wanna repeat what Pastor Ted said last week. That waiting on God is not passivity. It is actively putting our faith and hope in God to bring about what we cannot do on our own. This is our posture for Advent. And so during Advent, we wait for peace, not passively, but actively by engaging in small and large acts of peacemaking that bear witness to God's coming peace. Do you catch that? That's what we do. As people who follow the way of peace, we engage in small and large acts of peacemaking, which are not going to bring peace itself. Only Jesus can do that. But in these small ways, we point to the coming peace that God has promised through his son and which will be fulfilled at his second coming. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus told his disciples, for they will be called children of God. This is how you and I will be identified as Christians, not by what we are against, not by our vitriol, but by our peacemaking. That will be the identifier. And so we don't have it now. But as those small acts get multiplied in our community, in our families, in our relationships, in our neighborhoods, in our work, in our churches, and in our world, They bear witness to God's coming peace. We don't have it now, but it is coming. And so you see how that person is facing that unexpected illness that's kind of rocked their world with calm and dignity? That's God's coming peace. 
You see how that couple is growing in their unity despite the fact that their like work lives are crazy and their baby is crazy and just life just feels just so crazy and yet they are staying together. They're working hard to preserve unity. That points to God's peace. You see how that church is tangibly seeking to live out their faith by loving the least of these, by welcoming refugees, by caring for the poor, by speaking up for justice. Yeah, in some little ways, that points to God's peace. And so let's be very clear. These welcome kits, even if we had multiplied them to a million or a billion, they would not solve the refugee crisis but they will bring a small, small measure of peace. They declare, someone cares about you. While others may say you are not welcome, we welcome you. Grace and peace to you. So during this Advent, to all of us, to those of us who are longing for greater peace in our lives, for greater peace in the world. The good news of Advent is this, that peace has come, and peace is coming. Uh, If you're here um, and you're seeking faith, you're trying to understand what Christianity is all about, or maybe you're here because inside you've just been wrestling, you know, you sense a turmoil within, and you are longing for peace. Can I just declare to you that peace has come. God offers his peace to you. And our response is simply to receive it. To receive it with whatever modicum of faith that we have and to offer that. And that is enough. And that is enough. On the way back from Hawaii, as we were sitting in the airport getting ready to uh, get onto the plane, uh, this uh, young girl came up to me, and she had lollipops in her hands. And I didn't recognize her at first. And, you know, because, like, you don't talk to strangers, I was a little bit suspicious. Uh, but then it clicked to me. All right, I think I, I've seen her before. She was on our plane on the way there, sitting in the back with us where all of us were, like, going crazy. And what she was doing, she came up to me and she was like, oh, you know, these are for your twins. She wanted to offer something that would bring a little more sanity (laughs) to the plane ride back. Maybe it was, you know, there was something that she would get out of it too. (laughs) But in that small, you know, in that airport, she offered the gifts of grace and peace. During this advent, Let each of us receive first, because we have to receive first before we can give it. Let us receive the grace and peace in fuller measure. And let us offer grace and peace to those around us. Let's pray. I'd like to just offer just a brief moment of space for you to ask the question, God, what do you want me to know? How do you want me to respond? Just sit with that question before the Lord and in his presence. Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. You are the ultimate peace child. And we just, we just are humbled. We are humbled and amidst all the grief and suffering of this world, you came, you came to us, and you will come again. God, increase our faith. Give us greater faith. Where we lack faith, uh, support it, Lord. And I pray that you would help us to be a community that knows your grace and peace and offers it to this world. In Jesus' name.